Uh, thank you, Larry, because that was a great introduction. Uh, C-U-L, as we like to call it, cool. <laughs> is a spiritual healing center. We don't teach dogma. We don't have a, any dogma. No dog in that fight. <laughs> we believe that there are many paths to truth and they all lead to the same light. And so we support any path that you're on and we do it here in a community setting. So we get that added feeling of love and acceptance being part of something greater than just ourselves. All that we ask is that you come through those curtains with an open mind, leaving your baggage outside, all your preconceived notions, your, uh, your own beliefs, your prejudices, your feelings that, well, things have to be this way, or they should be this way, they should be done like this. Leave all of that out there, because we want you to come in empty and receive what you need, and leave full of peace, of acceptance, of love, and hopefully the connection to the great universal mystery of oneness. If you can have that experience this morning, then my prayers are answered, because that is my prayer for you and every Sunday that we gather. Be the feel the spirit flowing this morning as, as a preacher would say so this is the story of the eagle awohali and the condor tawodi we begin to see the condor and the eagle tawodi awohali share the skies and now in 2019 there are many awohali and tawodi in the same skies because they have learned that we can live as one. They have learned that there is enough to go around for everyone. So we're honored to have as our guest speaker with us today because not only is she a practicing psychologist, she's also a celebrated author, podcast influencer, and amazing flute player. As many of you witnessed last night. Who was there last night? Yeah, yeah. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. As a licensed marriage and family therapist, she loves working with individuals and families in Northern California. In her spare time, yeah, she's giving me the eye roll. <laughs> spare time. She also conducts trainings and workshops to pass along all that she has learned to others. So please help me welcome Dr. Patricia Bay. I'm so pleased to be here. We want to start out me teaching you something really cool, but we want to start it out with something that I absolutely love. Randy and I, when we are in our church, which is the Center for Spiritual Living, which is very much like this church, uh, we often do the Lord's Prayer. And Randy does it in Cherokee, and I do the translation. And it's I just think it's stunningly beautiful. So we wanted to do that for you before... I teach you about love and fear and the illusion of safety. And hmm? now tell me your name. Karen Beanstrow. 
Karen Reedstrom is going to assist us by playing the flute in the background. She's, she's playing my Pat Heron F sharp. So if you could dim the lights just a little, and if you could all just enter into a space of heart. This is the Lord's Prayer in Jalagi, which is my first language. So, Agido da, Gana da da, e e. Our Father, Heaven Dweller. Ganu go ta yo, G C S D, D J O I. My loving will be thy name. Jaga na ya hi, ji son, we ga no no goi. Your lordship, let it make its appearance. Ana son la hi, we na ga li sta, o ha no do sagai. Here upon earth, let happen exactly what you think. Naska gi ga na la da, jana ga la yestalaha. The same as it is done in heaven. Ja da no ga go sa, o ga li dosko ga di so ga ase. Daily our food, give it to us this day. Jagi so ga na gasi go no na da, di si gi di go ai no ase ga ya. Forgive us our debts, the same as we forgive. Just a yung don star dana, just a di yung ki. As we forgive our debtors. Ali tla so ta, o da la yi ja rea gonsa. And do not lead us into temptation. We sa gi stong gana a oste on a gi. Aski yo da la yi ski sa ja ko sa gaina. No gaya, i ji zi oni. Deliver us from evil everlasting. Just ja li gi o yi no ja, qui on ha ga son e. For thine, the Creator is. O li ja we ko gi ja, qui son e. And the power is. Ali son ja le kwa gi o gi si ko ko i gi ya. And the glory is forever. Salmana. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Your flute playing was beautiful. Thank you. I love that flute. It's one of my favorites. We're going to talk about something that's really cool. In my private practice of 35 years, give or take plus, I think it's plus. <laughs> um, what I came to, I went through a very, very hard time in 1992, and I won't go into what that was, it'll take too long. But in that space, I had to really reevaluate a whole lot of how I did things within myself, within my private practice, within what I taught people. And if you understand my background, I worked for Children's Protective Services doing sexual abuse investigation for many years and did trainings for law enforcement and social workers on how to interview children who have been sexually molested. So that was my background going into private practice. And then I specialized in sexual abuse in four states. I'm an expert witness and did that for many, many years. But what I began to recognize was that so much of what we deal with when we struggle is fear. And so when I went through this really um, difficult time that actually took me to my knees in 1992, I had to stop and look at just what I was afraid of. And I did a lot of the self-searching and waking up in the middle of the night and thinking. <laughs> my brain doesn't shut off at two in the morning very well. <laughs> but I started to figure out that that which we are afraid of calls us so much that we lose sight of how to do anything differently. So in that hard time came out an extremely beautiful blessing where I began to figure out, even if I'm really, really afraid, how can I shift that and not be afraid? And what if I stop being afraid? Is it going to get me? 
because I'm not ready? I don't have my sword and my shield ready to fight. What if I let down my guard? Am I safe? So as I began to lay there in the middle of the night a lot, thinking, how can I be safe and not be afraid? And I had to come to terms with that. And so I found a lesson for myself first, and then I began to live it, and then I began to teach it. And then in about 1998, I had spirit move through me to write the book that I wrote, Therapy in a Nutshell, 10 Simple Lessons That Will Change Your Life. And it was literally like being pushed in the back. I started to write this book, and I wrote it mostly from 11 at night till 3 in the morning because I had two kids. And I'd go to bed, and I'd, I'd think, oh, I just can't write tonight. And I swear, it's like somebody had their foot in my back. Get up. And I'm, oh, no. You ever argue with God, you know? <laughs> no. <laughs> Didn't work. I had to get up. So I wrote a lot from 11 to 3 in the morning. Because uh, the message I was getting was I needed to share this. And so since I wrote my book, I've been sharing this lesson. And this is the core lesson. The book has 10 lessons, but there's a lot more than that. And you can actually listen to my podcast that I give a lot of basic lessons. You can go to my website, patriciabay.com, and you can click on the podcast, and you can listen to it for free. I put it out, out there because not everyone can afford therapy. Not everybody can get to therapy. Not everybody can find a good therapist. Okay? I see lots of heads nodding. <laughs> over, over 30 years, I've trained a lot of interns, and my, my goal for them is to be really, really good therapists and go deep. Because when you can heal your core issues, you can change your world. So I'm going to give you a piece of the puzzle on how to heal your core issues. And then later on in the workshop this afternoon, we're actually going to make it personal for you. Let you take something that you need to get out of fear and learn to do it differently. But here's the basic lesson. Let's assume at any given moment, we can exist over here in a place of love. By a place of love, I mean a place of trust. Now, who are we trusting? Name one thing we need to trust to exist in a place of love. Yeah. Hmm? The universe, we need to trust what's around us. And that's what I call God. My word for that is God. Randy's word for that is creator, raised in Native American spirituality. Call that higher power anything you want. Jesus, Allah, Buddha, Shiva, your guru, it doesn't matter. There is a, a higher power greater than us. So when we trust, one thing we need to trust is that. Another thing we need to trust is us. And the third thing we need to trust is others. Now, I'm not telling you to get stupid. <laughs> you don't have to trust everybody right away. In fact, chapter two in my book is called Trusting Levels, which teaches you how to trust, how to date, how to form a relationship, how to be a good employer, because learning how to trust appropriately is really important, and there are actually very specific tools you can use to learn how to trust. So when I say trust, I mean trusting in an educated and intelligent and mindful way. So when we exist over here in this place of love, and we are trusting, we are trusting ourselves, we are trusting each other, and we are trusting that place we came from. Now, as human beings, in a nanosecond, you can leave this place and go way over here into this place of fear. Fear I call mistrust. And who do we mistrust? Ourselves, each other, and we feel forsaken. We feel left and alone. Have any of you ever been through a really horrid time in your life? I mean profound grief, profound loss, profound heartache. It's hard to get to the age we are without having experienced that. There's another lesson that I teach called Earth School, and Earth School is about why we are here to learn. And if anybody told you it was supposed to be good and happy all the time, they lied. Okay, it's not. <laughs> so, when we are afraid, we move over here into this place of mistrust, and now we don't trust ourselves, we don't trust others, because you hurt me. And we don't trust God because we feel forsaken. Why would the Creator, why would God let this happen to me if God loved me? 
Why would God take my child? Why would God hurt me? Why would God ruin my relationship? Why would God let me suffer? And the answer is our school. We are here to learn lessons. But in that moment when we're bleeding and when we're hurting, how many of you remember that? <laughs> Me at three in the morning wasn't real good at that. <laughs> I was just hurting. So over here in this place of fear, we don't trust anyone, including ourselves. So let's go back just a moment. We're over here and we exist in a place of love. We are calm, we are comfortable, things are going well, and boom, something happens. Whew, if I could walk faster, in a nanosecond, we're over here in a place of fear. And we th feel justified. The things that throw us into a place of fear faster than anything are fear of rejection. And rejection is actually a fear of abandonment. If you reject me, if you don't like me, then you're going to leave me. You're going to stop loving me. So we're not just afraid of not being liked. We're afraid of being left. It's kind of like the fear of heights. We, we went and did zip lining down in Camp Verde yesterday. And the, I'm standing up on that thing like, mm, he's ready to go. And the guy goes, you're afraid of heights. And I said, no, I'm not afraid of heights. But I don't really like the idea of dying. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he looked at me and I said, a fear of heights is not a fear of heights. It's a fear of death. And how you're going to get to that dead spot. Okay, so he's looking at me, and I said, I'm a shrink, leave me alone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's going like, okay, lady, just jump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> push him, <laughs> push her off there. <laughs> but it's so funny, because we think what we're afraid of is what we're really afraid of. It's not. Okay, it's not. We're afraid of being rejected, we're afraid of being abandoned, we're afraid of being alone. Alone with our own thoughts, alone with our own heart, not being touched and hugged and loved. We're, we're afraid that we're not good enough. The two core issues I see in therapy all the time are, I'm not good enough and I'm going to be left. Fear of self, being good enough, and fear of abandonment. Those are the ones that can kick our butt faster than anything else. So when we're over here in this place of love and something happens, we are now afraid of rejection or abandonment. And the other thing I see people afraid of is death or dying. Some people are not afraid of being dead. They have a very good spiritual foundation and they feel like, you know, I'm going to be fine. But how they get to that dead spot, <laughs> there's a lot that happens in the universe about avoiding that getting dead thing. Like standing on the box, getting ready to jump off this huge thing and, let the, and trusting that that zip line's going to hold, you know. It's an act of faith, right? But the idea was that could be a way you could get dead. And, and uh, it was a little nerve-wracking. But I rode the dragon. That's, that's what I call facing your fears. you got to ride the dragon. So I rode the dragon and ziplined, and it was fun. <laughs> the same way you look like a too. Oh, yeah. We look like minions with those hats on. <laughs> Especially Randy, because he they don't make a square one. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's, he put it, and it sat way up on top of his head, so we're all going. <laughs> I swear, I wanted to run to Michael's and buy one of those eyes that move and go right on the front of his, his hat. That was sitting way up on his head. He kept saying, where's the square hat? <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. He looked, he looked very cute. <laughs> anyway, so we're over here in a place of fear, and we're afraid of rejection, abandonment, and death or dying. And those things begin to rule our world. In fact, we get so good at moving from calm and comfortable in a place of love, boom, to a place of fear. We don't even know we did it. We're so good at it. Now, as human beings, when we are in a place of fear, we try all kinds of things to feel safe and we think it's okay. We feel justified because we've been harmed, we've been hurt, we've been victimized. Our heart is bleeding. So from this place of fear, we start to mobilize illusions of safety. Those are the things we think are gonna make us feel better, and they actually make us more afraid, and we don't realize it. Let's take, for example, jealousy. I see many relationships go under because of jealousy. I many, see many relationships that are just the jealousy is justified. Somebody's been harmed, someone's been betrayed, and they hold that in their heart. 
I see many people that form new relationships and they bring the baggage from the old relationship. My ex-husband burned me. My girlfriend slept with my best friend. Um, you said you loved me, but you left me. On and on and on. Everyone you know has been through something like that. Or you probably have a whole bunch of friends. Or you yourself has been harmed in a relationship. So out of fear, we bring that with us. I call that we color that with our crayons. So let's picture we have a crayon box and we are born into this world with some crayons. Now put that in any spiritual faith that you believe in. Either God gave you some crayons to bring in and said, here, you get to play with these or you had some birth trauma, or you had past life trauma. But we all have some trauma. We all have some crayons in our box. The idea is to recognize what crayons are in your box and when you pull them out to color your current life with them. So let's look at the idea of jealousy. There are crayons in that box, maybe a whole row of nasties. Okay, like you're going to leave me, you're going to betray me, you're going to cheat with my best friend, you're going to blend, da 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 So you're in this new relationship and you keep pulling out that crayon and going, coloring him with my angry jealousy crayon. You're afraid. Your illusion of safety is if I'm ready, if I'm on guard, if I've got my sword and my shield and I'm ready, you can't hurt me. I am defended. I am ready. I am watching your every move. I am checking your cell phone when you're in the shower. I'm watching you type in your email password. I'm wondering why you won't give me your Facebook password. I'm afraid. What am I afraid of? Abandonment, that I'm not good enough, that he or she was or is better than I am right here, right now. So my illusion of safety is if I can be aware, and I can be prepared, and I can have my sword and my shield up to fight, before it's even necessary, by the way, you won't take me unaware. I will not be made the fool. And I will see that you're going to hurt me. Now, here's the thing I figured out in 1992. And I'll, and I'll give you the brief version of what happened. My husband, Rich, and we'd been married um, 12 years at that time, had a year-long affair with his secretary. And it just about killed me. I had two little children. And it, it isn't, when you really get into that, you realize it's not the idea of bodies touching. It's the idea of you were going to leave our family. You don't feel the same way I felt about the sanctity of our family. And it took me out. And I had to keep working. So I got, I got really good. I'll teach you this coping skill. When you have a really nasty thing happening in your life, you open up your trunk, you put it in there, you close the trunk, and you go in and do what you have to do. You go to work, you come to a sermon, you feed the poor, you do what you have to do and you leave it in the trunk of your car because I guarantee you it'll be there when you come out. <laughs> so I had to learn to cope with this and I had to learn to work through the whole thing and it was a huge process. But as I lay there in bed in the middle of the night, realizing that my fear was doing exactly what I did not want it to do. I wanted my marriage to work. He, he was hugely remorseful in trying to fix things. It's not that simple, but he worked hard and said, I am here. I will do whatever. I, I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here. And, and we did a lot of work. It was five years before I remarried him, though. I, I didn't like him for a long time. So we worked hard. But as I lay in bed thinking, I've got this two-fold thing going. On one hand, I don't want him to hurt me again, and I hate him. I could even say that. I hated him. I wanted to push him away. But on the other hand, I wanted my family. Every, my family was everything to me, far beyond my broken heart. My two children meant more to me than my broken heart. And so I kept thinking, well, if I push him away in fear, how am I we ever going to find love again? And I'd lay there going, whoa, how do you do that? And I had to come to terms with that. And the thing I figured out was that my illusion of safety was if I could keep him at arm's length, if I could watch everything he did, if I could not be taken unaware again, I did not have to be afraid. But what I figured out was in being afraid and doing all that, 
I was pushing him away and not letting us heal. But I didn't want him in because I didn't like him. But I didn't want to push him away because I wanted my family. I had to come to terms with how my fear of being hurt, again, was harming me and harming my family. So what I came down to was, what do I need to not be afraid? And what we need is reassurance. So what Rich and I worked out, he was my husband of 39 years that died of a brain disease before, and Randy and I are together now, and I'm eternally grateful for that. But Rich was a wonderful man, but we were together 39 years, and in order for us to fix what was wrong, he had to be able to hear that I was afraid, and instead of taking it personally, like the bad Richies is what we called him, he had to offer me reassurance. So in my private practice all the time, I see people that are afraid. They're jealous, they're hurt, they're bleeding. And they rage at who they think victimized them. Because they want that person to make it better. But that's their illusion of safety. They want that person to make them not afraid. And the only one who can make us not afraid is us. And it comes from that trust in self, Trust that the world is not out to get us, even when others bring us pain. And trust that we are not forsaken, that there are reasons maybe that we cannot even see for what's happening to us. So as we begin to not be afraid, we can let the reassurance in. So what I learned how to do, that I then began to teach many people in my practice, is when you are afraid, Know that it's fear and ask for what you need. And think of it, asking for what you need is very different than blaming and pushing away and angry and how dare you and you hurt me and I'm the victim. So you have to be willing to give up your victimhood. We get a lot of energy out of being a victim. So when you give that up and you can say, I'm afraid right now. Rich learned how to say, what are you afraid of? Without feeling like I had my knife out to stab him. And I'd say, I'm afraid you're going to hurt our family again. And so he did this thing that he called, ah, babies. It's what he did when he had no idea what to say. <laughs> he'd pull me in, he'd go, oh, shh, ah, oh, baby, shh. And then he'd say, I hurt you horribly. I have learned from this. I choose you, I choose here, I choose us. I'm not gonna do this again. And I understand you're afraid, and all I can do is offer you reassurance. So the lesson was twofold. I had to be able to say I was afraid, and he had to be able to hear me. So in my private practice, this is what I teach couples all the time. This is what I teach people who are afraid of their boss are in a bad working situation, are afraid of their abusive parents who are now elderly and are, that's hard. Uh, how many people take care of their 90-year-old parent when their parent was the one who abused them? I mean, I've heard that many times. It's hard. It makes us afraid. So when we own our fear and we stop and say, what is the illusion of safety that I do? Do I isolate myself? Do I pull away? Do I push people away? Do I stop talking to others? Do I say, I'm never getting married again. I'm not getting in a relationship because all blank are horrible. Fill in the blank. Men, women, whatever. They're all horrible. That's our illusion of safety. I'm going to push the world away and then I'm going to stay safe. But then, when we want to live in this little spot of fear, how do we come over here and feel the joy of love? So as I worked that out for myself way back in 1992, and then I began to teach it to other people, I began to see healing that happened that was profound. I would see couples come in that had never dealt with an affair. It had always been, how long are you going to blame me for this? How many times do I have to hear that I hurt you and I was a schmuck? I mean, th that was their affair recovery technique. So he or she learned to shove it under, and the offender person learned to feel sanctimonious, and I told you I was sorry. That was called affair recovery back then. So they come in to see me, the affair's 10 years ago, and when they really start talking about the fear, it's like it happened yesterday. 
because it wasn't healed. I will tell you, shoving it under and pretending it didn't happen, whatever it is, the rape, the abandonment, the molest, the abuse, the affair, whatever harmed you, shoving it under does not heal it. But recognizing how it makes you afraid and how it pushes your world away and how it keeps you from feeling connected and loved and centered and able to open your heart to things like Garvel's meditation. That's the difference. So in the workshop this afternoon, we're going to take the idea of do I exist in a place of love or do I exist in a place of fear? And how do I know when I'm going back and forth? I'm going to teach you how you know. Okay? And then we're going to talk about how each of you do your illusions of safety and why. And how do I stop doing that? Because I don't want to do that, but I don't really know how not to do that because I'm really good at doing that. You know, we fine tune this fear thing. When you leave the workshop today, you will know what fear tastes like, smells like, feels like, thinks like. And you will become much more aware of when you do it and how to get back over there. So join us this afternoon. The workshop's $10, which goes to helping support this beautiful organization. And I want to help you heal. My, at the end of my podcast and my radio show that's on Saturdays, I end every radio show with, let's heal the world one hour at a time. <laughs> Thank you. And I just, I want to end with a form of affirmative prayer that I'm not sure, you, you might do something similar to it here, but in our church, Center for Spiritual Living, we have a thing that's called affirmative prayer. And if you look at a hand, this is the first thing. God is. The second thing is, I am. I am part of that divine oneness. The third thing is, I release all doubts. The fourth thing is, I accept that this is so, and I give thanks. And the last one is, and so it is. So I would like to bless you with an affirmative prayer. If you could close your eyes. There is one God, one beautiful loving entity in this whole entire universe. Call that energy what you will. Jesus, Allah, Buddha, God, the Creator, call it anything. And that energy does not care what name we give it, whether we masculinize it or feminize it. God is. And I am. I am an integral part of that incredibly beautiful oneness. And in this space right here, right now, I am recognizing that God is here in this room. God is manifesting through me. And as God manifests through me, that creative energy manifests through each and every one of you, which means that you and I are connected. Everyone in this room is connected with the divine oneness. So right here and right now, I know that I am part of that oneness. And I am going to release any doubts that this is so. If I thought I was separate, in this moment I am going to know that I am part of the great oneness. Even if I am flawed, even if I'm fearful, even if I'm angry, even if I'm sad, even if I'm joyfully happy, I am part of that great oneness. And I don't have to get better or change to be worthy of that oneness. So God is, and I am, and I release my doubts. And I accept that this is so. Not because I believe, because some things are true whether you believe them or not. You are part of this oneness, and you can have your doubts. But you release those doubts right in this moment, and you accept that it is true. And together with me, say, and so it is. One more time. And so it is. Thank you very much. I'll see you all this afternoon. We have room for all of you.